My name is John Howard Erickson. I was born on May 8th in 1951 in Oak Park, Illinois. When I was five years old, we moved to Wilmette, Illinois, a suburb uh, north of Chicago along shores of Lake Michigan. Our house was small in that town, but it was, it was very nice. But there were actually three houses that had been built on two lots, so they were very close together. And uh, we had four boys in our house, four boys in the house next door, and three boys in the house next to that. So uh, we were known as the Maple Street Mob. We were all kind of stair-stepped about the same ages. I was not the oldest of the group, so I too got hand-me-downs, but by the time the clothes had been through all the kids, you know, they were pretty well worn out. We uh, had a, a wonderful place to grow up right across the street from us. There was a small college that trained elementary school teachers, so they had a demonstration school there, which provided us with tennis court, basketball court, big playground area, all sorts of playground equipment and room to run. So we were just out and about all the time. So let's just say it was a wonderful place to grow up. And they had a wonderful park district with a huge, uh, wonderful beach on Lake Michigan. And in the summertime, we were always there playing. Had a big pier that went out into Lake Michigan. So we'd go down early in the morning and fish for perch. Just, we were going all the time, you know. I think one, of the advantages to growing up in that day and time was we kind of made our own fund. We weren't depending on anybody to take us someplace, coach us, organize us. We played our own games and made our own rules and self-governed. So I think that was a, a real good thing, uh, teaching me how to get along with others, um, be a part of a group, being somewhat independent. Mom was a Stay home mom, dad worked a lot. He got up at 4.30 in the morning. We never saw him in the morning. He was gone by five. Usually got home about seven o'clock and we had supper together. Every Saturday he went to work in the morning, came back uh, around noon or so. And mom and dad went out every Saturday night with their friends and we had a babysitter. Meal times were always important. Always had family dinner, always together. Um, always Sunday dinner with usually other people around. Very much Christ-centered, never missed church. Dad and Mom both very, very involved in church, church leadership, and more than just church, um, as an attendance and a place to hear about God. Um, God was modeled and, and known in our home. Loved playing soccer in the backyard and on the playground and everything, so couldn't wait to get to high school and and playing the soccer team there and did, which was a good thing for me. Our high school was very, very large, 800 and some kids in my class. So I had a soccer team, uh, my friends from junior high in the neighborhood, of course. We were in a, playing a soccer game and I went up to head the ball. And as I jerked my head down to hit the ball, apparently a player from the other team jerked his head back to get ready to head the same ball. And, and I guess hit me pretty hard because I woke up in the hospital and I uh, spent three or four days in the hospital with a severe concussion. Couldn't see anything for a while. My face was swollen solid and uh, broken nose and that was that. And as I got into high school, there was a you know church youth group and we met every week and on Sunday nights, we had social activities almost every week. So my social life to a large degree kind of revolved around the church group and it was several guys from the church group that I knew that were a year ahead of me that went off to Taylor University and convinced me to come visit them and, and to go there um, breaking my mom's heart because she always wanted me to go to Wheaton College and play soccer there for a coach who was one of her classmates but uh, went off to Taylor University not knowing what my major was going to be or what I wanted to do. And then uh, there were just a couple good, solid Christian churches in town. They asked if I could do the same type of thing, uh, smaller scale with the youth in town, the kids. 
Um, basically junior high kids. One of the churches had a bus and I'd organize activities uh, about once a month and take the all the kids from town, from the, the three churches that were there in town, to a minor league hockey game or shopping mall in Indianapolis or something uh, to get them out. And then we'd have a, always have a devotional time at the end. So um, that kind of led me into um, what my passion was, and, uh, and that was Christian camping, trip camping. I had a professor there taking one of her classes who was head of the Christian Education Department, and she too had a heart for Christian camping. And she encouraged me to maybe move on from my education degree that I was pursuing to be a physical education teacher. and. Uh, go into Christian education and look at camp directing, camp leadership administration as my career. So I did that. There was a, a couple of churches that we were acquainted with and a Christian youth organization called Youth for Christ or Campus Life um, asked us to, could we take kids and do something like that with them? Um, so we did and it kind of took off and uh, Spent my first five or six years after college sleeping bags, living out of vans, um, taking kids rock climbing, canoeing, whitewater rafting, spelunking. Um, took many, many trips out to the Wind River Range in Wyoming, backpacking, and uh, just had a wonderful time in ministry and uh, some of, I guess, maybe my best memories. One of the fellows I knew from the church youth group, he was a year behind me. Um, we weren't real close in high school, but he came to Taylor and I invited him to be my roommate and we roomed together and became the best friends, best of friends, business partners eventually. And uh, his name was Harvey. Harvey was the kind of guy that could do anything. And he was very, very good for me because he encouraged me that we can do this, we can do this, you know, it's. We may not have done it before, but we can do this. It didn't matter what it was. The school we were at was very, very isolated in the rural area, so there wasn't a whole lot to do there. So on weekends, we would, Harvey and I would load up in the winter and drive and go skiing or hiking, canoeing, camping, learned how to rock climb. And so we were always kind of gone doing something. Harvey and I, Jeffrey passed away last year, but we had a very special relationship. We did a lot of things together. Had a number of businesses together. Had the kind of relationship where we could be together all morning or afternoon long, enjoying one another's company and not really have to say a word. Worked together well. Um, knew what the other guy was thinking. We just, we just meshed. You know, one story that sticks in my mind, just one of those experiences that you, you don't ever forget. We decided in our youthful wisdom. We, we did not only rock climbing, but some mountaineering, going up, you know, glaciated, snow-covered mountains. And uh, the very best hoods in the world, the warmest were those that the Laplanders and Inuits had. And, they lined the rough of their hood with wolf skin. It's warm and it doesn't collect the humidity, the condensation as you breathe and ice up. So we said, well, we'll did just enough research to find out you could hunt wolves in Northern Ontario um, in the winter. So we decided that would be a good thing to do. We had uh, talked to the provincial people about where the best place to do this and how to do it. We got up there and uh, actually went into the last restaurant on the road before the road ended, the cafe, and there were some crust Hill guys there that said, here's where you want to go and what you want to do, and the only way you're going to find them is to watch them traveling across the lakes. So get on an island in the middle of the lake, and you, know, we, you can see two points of land where they might be traveling through. So we did that. And it got it got brutal cold. We backpacked, snowshoed in for three days, and it was it got terrible, terrible cold. 
and uh, remember that last night before we decided to give up and backpack out um, every night we would boil water over the over a fire in our little pot and then fill our aluminum water flasks with that hot water and put them in our bottom of our sleeping bags to keep our feet warm and uh, woke up about three in the morning and uh, reset do we uh, my, my feet are in bad shape I think my flask is frozen and sure enough the water flasks in our sleeping bags were frozen so we decided it was time to hike out and uh, see if we could make it back out in two days so we started snowshoeing out and the easiest way to snowshoe out through all of that heavily wooded area was if you could find a little creek to follow or be on the edge of the lake so we were snowshoeing on a frozen creek and uh, for whatever reason there was a little spring or something in an area and Harvey's snowshoes broke and he fell through so this is this is way serious out there so yeah, he had a full backpack on and everything and he's face down so I took up my backpack and shed my snowshoes and tramped out there into the creek which wasn't but a couple feet deep, it wasn't bad, drug him out. And then we knew enough to roll and roll and roll in the dry snow and that, that takes some of the water away. So immediately built the fire, put up the tent. We were wearing down parkers, which are worthless once they get wet. I'm super worried about him. So we're sitting around the campfire. He's in his sleeping bag. He's in my sleeping bag. Both have our pack boots off, trying to get them to dry out, sitting by the fire. So we uh, stayed there overnight. And then the next day, we knew we had to get out of there. We each had a couple of flannel shirts, but Wolf Boar flannel shirts. And uh, we took turns switching back and forth, wearing the one part that we still had. and. Uh, we weren't terribly cold on our upper bodies and our core as long as we were hiking, backpacking. So we started out and I just remember we saw, you know, we, we can't make camp. We've got to get as far as we can today, you know. So we hiked and hiked and hiked and hiked and we got to the point we were so tired, we would say, okay, 100 steps, take a break. 100 steps, we'll take a break. And I don't think either one of us would have made it out if we hadn't had the other guy, you know, there to, to push us on. Because we got down to the point where we were 20 steps and take a break and 20 steps and take a break. And, uh, you know, it was about an hour after dark and we, we got back to um, this kind of end of a dirt road trailhead where we left the Volkswagen van. We got in the van and Got it started up and warmed up and drove through the night. There was nothing. We're, this is very remote, so there's nothing around to go to. So we, we we drove through the night, got back across the border, and went straight to Minneapolis where we knew knew some folks. So this was no cell phones back then. So we got to their house and both ended up in, in the emergency room. Um, Harvey with frostbite and lost just one toe and I with burns on my feet. <laughs> they both, we both felt the same, but his were frozen and mine were burned from being too close to a fire trying to warm up. So um, that's just, I don't know, nothing deep or profound about it, but uh, one of those experiences where you go through with somebody and there's a bond there that, you know, will, will be there forever. I accepted Jesus as my savior at summer camp in Wisconsin and uh, the Lord has been faithful to me ever since. My favorite verse is, be still and know that I am God. I can't begin to fathom how God works, how he pulls everything together, how he leads and directs and manages our lives. So I I think that's very, very important is to be still regularly and breathe in his presence. 
and really concentrate on the reality that he loves me, that I am his, and that he does truly want to be intimately involved in my life. And that being still and waiting and knowing that there's somebody there, it's worked for me. Another verse, I don't know if I fully interpret it theologically correctly, but in the 23rd Psalm, he makes me to lie down in green pastures. At this stage of my life, I've recently fully retired, had some dramatic changes from being very, very involved and active and leading and building and mentoring and administering and being essential to the operation of an organization and an effort to being fully irrelevant in a very short time. And I've struggled with it. The Lord has impressed that verse on me, makes me lie down in green pastures. I'm very blessed to live where I do with a wonderful wife, instead of having to be active and running and going all the time. I'm lying down in green pastures. My friends, kids and grandkids are scattered all over the country. Don't get to see them often, but I think the Bible pushes us towards the reality that the best and strongest and most effective way is to have an impact on someone's life consistently is to be praying for them all the time. That's how I'm spending my time these days. Aside from the gift of Jesus as my savior, um, that's the greatest gift God has ever given me, was Judy. We've shared a relationship that I can't describe in words, but she has loved me and affirmed me when I needed it most in every day since, and encouraged me and truly partnered with me. As the years have passed and we've grown closer and closer, we've come to just enjoy exactly the same things for the most part, and just enjoy being together very happy and content to have our time together be our social life. Truly the love of my life and the best partner ever. So I can't talk about things of importance and significance in my life without talking about Judy because she just means everything to me. A wonderful gift from the Lord. In my golden years or whatever they're called, I'm very content. The Lord has been so good to me. I love the person I live with. I love the place I live at. I love the things I get to do. My only concern is that I don't believe all of my boys, all of my sons, know Jesus as their Savior and are walking in fellowship with Him and weighs heavily on my shoulders each and every day because I can't imagine heaven being heaven if my boys aren't there with me. And I pray for them all the time. That's the thing that's most important to me these days and it's most on my mind. I just want them all to know uh, that I did my best. Tried hard. I carried my lunch pail to work every day. I had jobs where I showered before work, and I had jobs where I showered after work. Uh, but I always gave it my best. And that was always to provide for them. And I wanted to know that my deepest desire for my boys Is that they come to know the Lord and walk with Him. They have Jesus as their Savior. And if I could see that happen, I would be a totally fulfilled man.